All right, so that finishes peptic ulcer disease and GERD agents. We're going to move forward and start with this question. So we have a two-year-old boy who was brought to the emergency room for fever and lethargy that began the preceding night. One week ago, he developed watery, non-bloody diarrhea that his parents treated with antidiarrheals. So is that okay? Can we do that? Uh, he has not passed stool for two days. The boy is febrile, tachycardic, and has a visibly distended abdomen, absent bowel sounds, and a diffuse abdominal tenderness. His abdominal plane film, seen right here, if you guys see this, what do you guys think this is? This is one of those common signs. Um, uh, the patient has most likely developed which of the following conditions as a report, result of inappropriate treatment. So it seems over here like he had a little bit of a diarrhea spell that the patient parents treated with antidiarrheals. He's febrile, distended, absent bowel sounds. So he has a little bit of, you know, some, some warning signs going on here. And then he has this thing right here, which we would uh, call a lead pipe sign. And so what is this issue? He has a toxic megacolon. And as we'll talk about in the future, a patient with signs such as these, this may be a little more um, benign because we'll talk about some examples of when to not give antidiarrheals for diarrhea. In this case, it might have been more of a closer call because it's watery and non-bloody. So we'll see. But in this question specifically, he's developed a toxic megacolon as to now having the distended abdomen, absent bowel signs, and um, diffuse abdominal tenderness. And now we'll go talk about IBD. Hey guys, welcome back. Um, we are uh, going today to be covering uh, a bunch of uh, GI issues. <clears throat> and the first one of them is inflammatory bowel disease. So in inflammatory bowel disease that includes Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, um, as you've covered it in uh, pathology, um, the problem in inflammatory bowel disease is really too much inflammation. Uh, but the problem with this inflammation, it's very nonspecific. We can't uh, put our fingers on what exactly is causing the inflammation. Um, and the goal of pharma pharmaco pharmacotherapy is to reduce this inflammation. You're going to ask me how. Um, the first thing that we can do is to uh, decrease prostaglandins, uh, leukotrienes, and NF-kappa B uh, release. This is sort of like the you know, the last products of the inflammatory pathway. And we can do this by glucocorticoids. Of course, we know how glucocorticoids uh, work. Uh, they decrease, you know, they decrease all of these, the prostaglandin, leukotriene, and nf kappa B. Uh, we also can use drugs called aminosalicylates. Aminosalicylates pretty much are a derivative of aspirin, and they decrease um, uh, prostaglandins, leukotriene, and nf kappa B. Uh, second thing that we can do is that we can inhibit the leuco leukocytes, the white blood cells that are actually responsible for uh, inflammation. So what we can do is that we can uh, use anti-metabolites, um, so things that inhibit the DNA synthesis, uh, like methotrexate um, and azathioprine or 6 mercaptopurine. So these are inhibiting the, you know, we're pretty much killing the white blood cells. Um, a third thing that we can do is um, we can stop uh, or we can block uh, TNF, tumor necrosis factor. And as you know, tumor necrosis factor is secreted from the macrophages in response to uh, inflammation. Um, and we can use anti-TNF agents like infliximab, sertuluzumab, adalumumab, and all of these are monoclonal antibodies that are designed to block uh, TNF. Uh, lastly, which is last last line in pharmacotherapy, is um, uh, a drug called nitalizumab, and nitalizumab is an anti-integrin. You guys remember in the leukocyte migration how they kind of 
get stuck in the walls um, of the tissue and they adhere uh, via integrins. So um, scientists have developed a medication that blocks these integrins called nitiluzumab. And that's the final step of how we can reduce the inflammation um, in inflammatory bowel disease. Of course, um, if pharmacology therapy is not sufficient, then you can go to surgical surgical therapy where you can remove the um, the diseased part of the bowel. So um, I really like this. This is from class. I borrowed it from uh, Dr. O'Donnell's uh, lecture. Um, and it shows you the stepwise approach of inflammatory bowel disease from mild, moderate to severe. Uh, mild disease is you start with, um, as we said, the aminosalicylates and the glucocorticoids. So, uh, for example, budesonide is a glucocorticoid, um, topical corticosteroids, antibiotic if there is infection, and then aminosalicylates. Uh, moderate uh, disease, you kind of kick it up a notch. Uh, use the anti-metabolites like az azathioprine or 6-mercaptopurine, methotrexate, or oral corticosteroids. Now we've moved from topical to oral corticosteroids and TNF antagonists. And then severe disease, um, you can use intravenous corticosteroids, TNF antagonists, cyclosporine, heavy duty um, uh, immune suppression, and netalizumab, and then finally surgery. So this is sort of like the stepwise approach. In the exam, uh, they'll most likely ask you about a patient who has a mild disease and they'll ask you what to choose. So first line is you know, either topical corticosteroids or aminosalicylates or moderate disease, which will be anti-metabolites or TNF antagonists or severe disease, uh, IV corticosteroids or you know, any of these things. Um, so the first class of drugs that we're gonna talk about is the aminosalicylates. Um, so example is mesalamine and sulfasalazine. Um, how they exactly work, we are not sure, um, but um, it is thought that they decrease prostaglandins and leukotriene, sort of how aspirin does. So there are kind of a modification of, um, of uh, aspirin. Um, they are used for topical superficial inflammation, specifically for ulcerative colitis. I think um, the important thing about the aminosalicylates is to understand uh, where they work. So, of course, in ulcerative colitis and Crohn's, there are specific areas of inflammation. So for ulcerative colitis, for example, the rectum is the most involved and the um, and the ileum. For Crohn's, there is, you know, specific parts uh, that are, uh, you know, patchy parts that are affected. So um, we can design these drugs to go and get absorbed into these areas that are affected. So for example, mesalamine is designed to be absorbed in the proximal, uh, proximal ileum. Uh, sulfasalazine or a bunch of other drugs, uh, these are prodrugs, so they're converted into 5-aminosalicylate, um, which are absorbed into the distal ileum or the uh, colon as well. Um, in addition to that, we can give uh, erectile uh, mesalamine or erectile sulfasalazine uh, for patients who have proctitis, so inflammation of the rectum, because we don't want the drug to pass through the whole gut to get into the rectum where we can just give it as a suppository to reach the site of inflammation. So use of aminosalicylate is induction and maintenance of uh, disease, specifically ulcerative colitis. Uh, so they're the first line. They're also used for mild Crohn's disease. Uh, side effects is sulfasalazine causes bone marrow uh, suppression. Uh, next uh, group of uh, IBD drugs is the anti-metabolites. The first one is azathioprine. And I'm not going to talk too much about azathioprine because we've already covered it in the cancer section. But very quickly, it's metabolized into 6-mercaptopurine, um, uh, which is a purine analog uh, leading to inhibition of DNA synthesis. Um, it's used in induction and remission of moderate IBD. So first we talked 
about the amino salicylates, these are for mild um, UC or Crohn's or mild IBD. Isothiaprine is for moderate IBD. So you spare the patient glucocorticoid. That's why they're called glucocorticoid sparing. Uh, the problem with azathioprine uh, is that it's a slow onset, so it's co-administered with methotrexate to kind of fasten the recovery for the patient. Um, side effects, as we talked about before, myelosuppression and hepatotoxicity, and uh, there is an important drug-drug interaction with allopurinol uh, because allopurinol inhibits the xanthine oxidase, uh, enzyme, and that's the enzyme that metabolizes 6 mercaptopurine, so you end up with toxicity uh, of either 6 mercaptopurine or azathioprine, which are pretty much the same thing. Uh, next agent is methotrexate. Uh, uh, just a little reminder, it's the dihydrofolate reductase. Um, and dihydrofolate reductase inhibitor, so it inhibits dihydrofolate uh, reductase. Um, and it's a folic acid analog. Um, it's indicated for induction and remission of Crohn's, and it's also glucocorticoid uh, sparing. Uh, it causes hepatotoxicity and renal insufficiency at low, low doses, and at high doses, it causes myelosuppression. Uh, next group of agents are the uh, anti-TNF. So example of the anti-TNF medications is uh, infliximab. Uh, that's the that's the important one to be aware of. The other one is sertralizumab and the levomab, and as you know, they end up with the map, so they're a monoclonal antibody. Um, these medications bind and neutralize TNF, and as we've talked about, TNF is an important factor in the pathology of IBD. Uh, they are used in moderate to severe IBD, so keep in mind which class of IBD they are used in. So they're moderate to severe IBD. Uh, and fliximab is actually indicated for ulcerative colitis only. I'm not sure what the reason is, but um, that you know, it's indicated for UC only. That's not some big thing to be aware of for exams. It's just you know a side note. Um, what I want you to be aware of exams uh, is actually the side effects of TNF. It's very 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 important, and you'll see this uh, come up on <coughs> on block exams. Uh, UWorld questions and shelf exams is the side effects of anti-TNF. So if you remember, a TNF is secreted from the macrophages and it's used to wall off uh, bacteria. And one of the biggest things that are walled off uh, is tuberculosis. You remember that tuberculosis uh, is walled off by uh, TNF causing a granuloma around the uh, mycobacteria tuberculosis. If you give anti-TNF, you will end up having reactivation of tuberculosis. Um, so that's why for patients that we give anti-TNF um, inhibitors or t like yeah TNF inhibitors, we need a baseline TB test um, and then monitoring afterwards to make sure that the patient does not uh, get TB reactivation. Uh, so that's the biggest side effects of the anti-TNF. Also, there are some side effects that are related to the drug being an antibody. Of course, you are introducing um, a foreign substance to the body, so you can get antibodies to this drug, or you can get some infusion reaction uh, from these medications. Um, I just wanted to clarify one thing um, with the TNF. Uh, which can be a source of confusion for some people. Um, so we talked about the anti-TNF uh, alpha, like infliximab, citrulizumab, and adalimab. There is also um, an anti-TNF, which is called etanercept. Etanercept is a medication used for rheumatoid arthritis. And I cannot recall if we have talked about rheumatoid arthritis or not, but the mechanism of action is slightly different than these medications. Etanercept is uh, actually a fusion uh, uh, inactivator, fusion receptor inactivator. So what, what that means? It means that it goes to the TNF receptor, it fuses with it and inactivates it. It doesn't bind to TNF itself, but it binds to the receptor, fuses with it and inactivates it. And test examiners love, love to examine you on the difference between etanercept and 
um, the anti-TNF uh, inhibitors, so the infliximab and adalumumab, uh, because it's an important distinction in the mechanism. So again, infliximab, adalumumab, they bind and neutralize TNF. Uh, etanercept uh, fuse with the receptor, with the TNF receptor, and inactivates it. It actually doesn't bind to TNF. So I hope that point is clear for you. Uh, next is, uh, after a TNF, is the glucocorticoid. So example is prednisone, prednisolone, and butesamide. Um, they inhibit phospholipase A2, NF-kappa-B, and TNF. They also inhibit leukocyte adhesion. Um, glucocorticoids uh, are used to induce remission of moderate to severe disease. They're not used for maintenance. Um, specifically the uh, the oral or the IV, but they're used for induction of um, of maintenance. Um, that being said, we can use sometimes an enema uh, like budesonide uh, suppositories or budesonide enema for mild forms of IBD, uh, specifically ulcerative colitis, uh, because it affects the rectum. Uh, oral uh, glucocorticoids are used for moderate disease, and IV glucocorticoids are used for severe disease. Um, side effects, I said here already covered times 100. We didn't really cover it 100 times, but you should be familiar with the side effects of the glucocorticoids. And I pulled this slide from the um, asthma review where we covered glucocorticoids. I'm not going to go over everything. But I will go over the GI specific side effects since we are talking about GI um, in this uh, section. Um, so glucocorticoids actually cause peptic ulcers in uh, they in high doses they can cause peptic ulcers because they decrease the protective prostaglandin release um, from the stomach, so they can cause uh, peptic ulcers. So that's something to be aware of. Uh, lastly, the big gun or heavy duty. Uh, medication used for uh, IBD is natalizumab. Natalizumab um, is an anti-integrin. So I, again, if you remember, the integrins are responsible for the leukocyte adhesion and tissue infiltration. These are the little uh, sticky, sticky things that the white blood cells kind of stick into so that they can infiltrate the tissue. Uh, natalizumab is indicated for moderate to severe Crohn's and multiple sclerosis, actually. Um, everything that I talked about natalizumab is not as important as this next point. Uh, the biggest, biggest side effect uh, that is very important clinically and very, very high yield for exams is uh, the reactivation of JC virus. So JC virus is a virus that likes to go to the brain, you'll cover it in micro, and causes uh, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. So progressive, it comes in stages. Multifocal, that means it hits different parts. Leuco, white, encephalopathy. So it hits the white matter of the brain and causes encephalopathy. Um, so for that reason, uh, nitalizumab became a very dangerous drug and it was withdrawn from the market and reinstated only for refractory Crohn's disease and multiple sclerosis. And it required something called a REMS program. Um, REMS program is called, uh, is REMS stand for Risk Evaluation and Mitigation Strategy. And that means that the provider has to, uh, or the, the doctor has to uh, enroll in that program and the patient has to enroll and it just goes through uh, multiple safety steps. But what I want you to be aware of is the PML or Progressive Multifocal Leukoencephalopathy. Here's a picture of PML on MRI, um, and you'll see these white matter plaques um, sort of resembles multiple sclerosis a little bit, uh, but you'll see them in a lot of uh, gyri or a lot of parts in the, in the brain, and it's very classic for PML. And that is one thing that you will be tested on, the side effect of natalizumab. Um, so it's, it's caused by reactivation of which virus? JC virus, yes, and then it causes progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy.